everybody. This is Jennifer Schaus, and we are coming to you live today from Washington, D.C. at the invitation of our friends from the Western Michigan Apex Accelerator. So thanks for being with us, and thanks to the Western Michigan Apex Accelerator for asking us to speak in their series. Today we are covering, as you can see, GSA schedules, requirements, and reality. Let me go through our agenda here, and then we'll go ahead and dig in. Uh, first, I'll tell you a little bit about me and what we do here in DC. Uh, we'll then cover just GSA basics at a very high level. We'll talk about the pros and cons, the requirements to get onto a GSA schedule, what that looks like in real life, which will be vastly different from uh, what it is on paper. And then I'll uh, conclude with some uh, considerations and then happy to field any questions that you have. Okay, let's dig into the agenda, or I'm sorry, into the uh, the background. So first and foremost, uh, I've been in federal contracting for 20 plus years. I've got the gray hair and the wrinkles to prove it. And we are based in downtown DC, but work with clients worldwide. Our clients include product, service, and software companies, and we help them navigate the federal market through uh, focusing on helping them with the GSA schedule as well as other contract vehicles. Some of the other services we offer are listed here at the bottom of your screen. We also have a wide variety of resources available for aspiring or active government contractors, including a library of over 600 plus complimentary government contracting videos on our YouTube channel. There is absolutely no fee to subscribe to our channel. Uh, and you've got access to 30 plus videos on um, GSA schedules. And you also have access to um, over 600 uh, webinars on other topics, including the FAR, the DFARS, FAR supplements, and other strategic and tactical topics. Uh, for those companies that are selling services, typically professional services to federal contractors. This would be banks, law firms, um, HR uh, companies, uh, data aggregators. We provide digital advertising opportunities. You can sponsor our webinars. You can put on your own webinar. You can advertise in our newsletter, and you can sponsor any of our upcoming um, in-person networking events that include both government and government contractors. I kind of went backwards on that slide, but uh, I don't want to read verbatim from these. So let's go ahead and move to the next. We're going to cover the GSA schedule basics. Uh, again, this is the who, what, and why, just so you know uh, for context uh, what we're talking about today. So GSA, General Services Administration, who are they? They are a non-appropriated agency, which simply means that they are not funded by taxpayers. So they are self-funded, established uh, many years ago, back in 1949, and they manage the other federal agencies. So the way that GSA is organized, uh, they are split into two main uh, sections. One is public building service, PBS. So GSA is the federal real estate uh, company, or we'll call them the federal landlord. Um, and they oversee all of the federal buildings. Uh, next, the um, next portion of how GSA is organized includes FAS, which is the Federal Acquisition Service, and that includes the Multiple Award Schedules Program, GSA Schedules, um, for another uh, way to put it, which is what we're gonna talk about today. And just as a um, FYI, GSA also has uh, control over um, technology transformation services. These are going to be the various government websites. Um, so everything from SAM.gov to FPDS to acquisition.gov and, and more, GSA oversees those. So uh, keep that in mind. They're, they're more than just the schedules program. Uh, and the way that they make money is by charging fees to their tenants within the PBS uh, section, and then they charge a GSA schedule tax, I'll call it, um, formerly known as the industrial funding fee, and that is for the, um, the schedule holders. And we'll talk more about that as we get further into today's program. So that was the who and the what, uh, the why we're going to eventually get to, but let me start at the top here. 
So MAS, multiple awards schedule, it just means there are multiple companies who are awarded the GSA schedule. Um, and that award is basically zero dollars. So there's no guarantee that you're going to sell anything when you are on the schedule. It just means that you are on this vendor shortlist. There's about 18 to 20,000 companies on the schedule that are uh, doing, let's say, uh, billions of dollars worth of federal contracting. And the schedules program is set up so that companies are selling uh, to the government commercially available product services and software. Uh, the way that a vendor would get listed or get onto this GSA schedule, uh, you would go to sam.gov and type in the solicitation number, which you see right here at the top uh, second bullet on the right hand side. And that would give you all of the proposal uh, documents that you'll need to complete in order to get onto the schedule. Um, now, I mentioned it is a vendor shortlist, so uh, a smaller category of companies uh, will have access to various RFPs and solicitations once they are on the schedule. Um, but the most important takeaway from this slide, at least, is the schedule is really only a marketing tool it is absolutely not required it's a good uh it can be a good uh tool for companies who are well versed in government contracting but uh again not required at all the schedule is also where companies are segmented by what they are offering um, through what's called special item numbers or SIN numbers, S-I-N, again, special item numbers. So these 18 to 20,000 companies are on the GSA schedule. And the, again, the way that they are segmented by what they're selling is through special item numbers. Some of the special item numbers will be an exact match for your NAICS code, your North American Industry Classification System. Um, sometimes they're similar, the SIN numbers sometimes are similar to the NAICS codes, other times they're vastly different. Um, so for example, if you're selling IT professional services, which is one of the more popular SIN numbers, um, the SIN number for that is 54151S. Um, but again, there are over uh, 300 SIN numbers, so you would need to identify what uh, SIN or SIN numbers your products fall under and then ensure that you meet those requirements. How do you know the requirements? Yes, you're gonna hear from me today on those, but we don't have enough time to go through the requirements for all 330. So I would encourage you to hop over to sam.gov, download the solicitation and look at the required documentation. Uh, okay, so we covered the who and the what. Uh, as far as why, why would somebody want to get onto the schedule? and be on this vendor shortlist, uh, it makes it easier for the federal government to purchase from you because they know that you have been, I'll say, checked out or vetted on what it is you are offering. So your past performance exists, um, your technical merit is there, and most importantly, um, and the biggest focus of the schedule is that GSA has obtained your best price. Uh, and that, again, is really the main focus of the schedule. And we're going to talk in more detail about that and actually how GSA obtains your best price. So uh, the schedule is, in fact, a contract with firms and conditions. So initially, when you are awarded the schedule, um, it's a five-year contract. And at the end of those five years, you'll have three option periods that are each also five years. So uh, in essence, from start to finish, it becomes a 20 year contract uh, with the caveat of you meeting the terms and conditions and uh, maintaining uh, a compliant schedule. So one of the main terms and conditions is meeting GSA's, I'll call it sales quota, um, which recently changed uh, with one of the latest updates. Uh, the new quota is what you see here on the screen, $100,000 for the first five-year period. And then for each of those additional five-year periods, $125,000. If you add it all up for those 20 years, it comes up to $475,000, uh, which is not a ton of money over 20 years. So if that's all you think you can do, then the schedule is probably not the right marketing tool for you. Um, it could, in fact, uh, be a liability. And again, we'll talk about that uh, in the coming slides. 
So again, uh, it's primarily focused on your price. So before you get onto the schedule, you'll open your Komona and share information with GSA, primarily around your pricing policies and the discounts that you give. GSA's main goal, and this is taken verbatim, is to secure equal to or better than your most favored customer or your MFC, um, and you'll identify who your MFC is. Uh, again, most favored customer. This is not the customer that has a really cool logo or they invite you to their Christmas party every year. This is the customer uh, who you are giving your best pricing to on a standard or regular basis. Um, once you are on the GSA schedule, your rates are a not to exceed rate. Your GSA rates are a not to exceed rate, which means that as you start bidding for work through your schedule, uh, and through your schedule, there should be highlighted and uh, emphasized, you're encouraged to give discounts. Um, again, through your schedule. Outside of your schedule, uh, there are gonna be limitations and some repercussions if you go, uh, if you dip below your GSA rates. Um, as I mentioned, GSA is a non-appropriated agency, so they are self-funded and they are funded through the part of it is through the schedules program. So all of the GSA schedule holders will pay GSA less than 1%, it's 0.75% of their GSA schedule sales only. So if your GSA schedule sales are zero, you owe GSA nothing. Uh, even if you have a million dollar contract with Department of Agriculture, if they did not purchase from you through the schedule, then you don't pay GSA anything. If they did, you'll pay them 0.75%. That payment, again, is the IFF, industrial funding fee, and it's either paid on a quarterly or monthly basis, depending upon how your TDR, transactional data requirements, are set up. And that's um, set up during the, as you're going through the GSA uh, proposal, um, specifications on the GSA eOffer platform. So if in some ways this is, I'm gonna just pause here and make a statement that you have to think of GSA as a uh, for-profit entity. So they have an incentive to um, kind of, we'll say uh, guide some of the larger businesses through uh, because GSA uh, is kind of betting uh, that the well-known brand names that are applying to get onto the schedule are probably going to have a better chance of bringing in revenue versus Joe's Plumbing Shop um, or whatever the business is or any small business. Uh, and I just say that from years of experience, 20 years of experience working with some publicly traded firms whose names are uh, household names uh, and submitting proposals to GSA on their behalf, uh, and having them uh, accelerated uh, simply because GSA um, assumes that once they're on the schedule, they're going to be doing more business and um, and, and GSA will recoup that uh, IFF fee from them. Um, but either way, uh, large business, small business, you still want to have a competitive and compliant proposal uh, and ensure that um, you know exactly what you're signing up for. So sorry for that side remark, but um, uh, as I mentioned, GSA is one of many, many, many ways that the government can purchase, and this uh, chart doesn't really not do us uh, do that statement justice. Um, uh, I haven't listed everything out, but just some highlights here, just to give you a, a short visual as we're kind of looking at this from the um, 30,000 foot view. So if we call this how the federal government purchases, they've got many, many options. Again, GSA being uh, one of those with, GSA average sales coming in uh, about 10 to 15 percent of the time, still representing billions of dollars with a B. Uh, but most of what we see as far as federal government purchases happen on SAM.gov, which is where there is uh, where you'll see the full and open competition. So anybody with uh, an internet uh, connection that has access to SAM.gov, which is basically anybody, uh, can respond to those solicitations. Uh, there are also department and agency contract vehicles, uh, and I have them listed on the next slide. GSA schedules, obviously, the set-asides, uh, as I go down the list, will represent the 8As, the women-owned, veteran-owned, hub zone, um, and all of the others. 
simplified acquisitions. Those are the simplified acquisition threshold is at 250,000 for small businesses. When it moves to, uh, we're talking about construction, that um, tops off at 750,000. Uh, sole source means that there's only one uh, source on the planet uh, of uh, whatever the solution is that can provide that solution. And then we have uh, OTAs, um, which are gaining some traction, uh, and they were pretty popular during, uh, I'll call it that COVID contracting era. So everybody should be able to uh, pull up this specific data for the specific solution that you are selling. You should know uh, in dollars and also even percentages uh, what how much the government is purchasing of your solution overall within various contract vehicles and then you can let that data guide your strategy how you spend your money how you spend your time uh, and where your efforts are going to be deployed and all of this data is available uh, in any public sector that you're selling uh, into so again the federal market you can find this data on sam.gov usa spending fpds uh, and many others or you can simply subscribe to uh, any of the many, many, many data aggregators that are uh, out there on the market, uh, and there are plenty. Oh, I mentioned there are some other uh, contract vehicles that departments and agencies have. Um, sometimes they have it specifically to meet a, um, uh, a mission-oriented need that they have within their agency. Uh, sometimes it's designated for a specific um, uh, set aside uh, designation. Um, GSA has a, a VETS schedule. We're not really talking about that today, and I'll cover that in a moment. Um, uh, another reason that departments and agencies may also set up their own contract vehicle is so that they don't have to pay GSA that 0.75%. Um, I did mention that you are paying that, but that 0.75% actually gets built in to your price uh, you will then extract that out and pay it to gsa but at the end of the day your customer is the one that is um is paying that uh that fee uh so here are just some of the samples that are out there and this i'm not advocating that you get on or don't get on these contract vehicles again this should be part of your uh, market research uh, which should be very uh detailed and, and certainly can be again because of the public data, the data that's publicly available in this, uh, in public sector contracting. So uh, again, the, the big takeaway here is research, 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 do your homework, have specific numbers and let data guide, let data and the trends uh, guide how you spend your time, effort and money and let that be part of your uh, strategy on an ongoing basis. Okay, now uh, we'll talk about the GSA pros and cons um, because uh, this is not a silver bullet. Uh, nothing really is, but um, it's good to know, uh, generally speaking, um, and these advantages and disadvantages will vary based on your company and the, the research that you've done. So generally speaking, uh, there are some pros to having the schedule. It, uh, it certainly will um, you know, give you some clout. It is a status symbol and shows that you're, we'll say, somewhat serious about the market. Um, people will uh, make the assumption incorrectly or correctly that uh, you know something about federal contracting. Um, for the, uh, the buyers on the federal side, it does make the procurement process easier for them. So if they had an easy button, um, an easy button would more or less equate to a contract vehicle, which a GSA schedule is. So it gives them a bridge to get to you. Uh, but um, again, uh, you are going to need a, a relationship. It is a supplement to the relationship. Once you're on the schedule, you'll have access to GSA eBuy. And this is a portal by which GSA sends out RFPs to the companies within specific SIN numbers, special item numbers. So if you are on the special item number for 54151S, that's IT Professional Services, you will only get the GSA RFPs uh, sent to you for that particular SIN number. Um, and so you may see some of these uh, solicitations and opportunities and think, wow, this was written just for me. 
But keep in mind, this is just like SAM.gov, only a smaller set of uh, competitors. However, you're going to see on the next slide, the disadvantage then is that the competition is going to be more fierce. It's more intense because these are companies that do exactly what you do. Um, and if you're new to federal contracting and you're getting on the schedule, you're really just, you're, you're jumping into the uh, professional, you're going from high school basketball to the NBA and uh, you potentially could be um, squashed or, or sitting on the bench. So again, you wanna make sure that you're, uh, you have a better understanding of federal contracting before you pull the trigger here. Some of the, uh, the cons, we talked about the pros. So the cons here, again, more intense competition. And uh, again, the main focus of the schedule is in fact your pricing. So your GSA rates are going to be a price ceiling. So as you start bidding for work through your schedule, you're gonna be encouraged to give lower rates. Uh, which will put your margins at risk or uh, potentially eliminate them uh, based on how your pricing is structured even before you get onto the schedule. So, uh, and we'll talk about that uh, in more detail as we uh, get further into today's program. Uh, relationships, I cannot stress enough how important they are in business. Uh, and so if you, or just using the schedule as a mechanism to uh, market your business and you don't have a relationship, a you know, a human to human relationship, this is not going to serve you well. Um, also, once you're on the schedule, this is going to require a little bit of uh, back office work, uh, some compliance, some reporting, um, GSA potential, I call them audits, the GSA actually calls them uh, customer assisted visits, CAVs. Um, and so, there is a level of effort that needs to be deployed once you're on the schedule, as well as just the general sales and marketing of your schedule. Uh, plus, you want to make sure that you're going to meet, but preferably exceed that GSA sales quota. Okay, another reason that we're here, we're going to talk about the GSA requirements. Again, you can find them all on SAM.gov by plugging in the solicitation number and looking at the requirements for each and or for the um, send number that you want to pursue. Okay. So uh, again, there's the solicitation number. GSA is currently on refresh number 19. What this means is uh, a couple years ago, GSA had various schedules um, that had similar SINs grouped together. And what they did uh, is consolidated all of these various schedules into one main MAS, multiple awards schedule. So now all of the companies that are on the schedule basically hold the GSA schedule. And again, the differentiator are the SIN numbers. When that happened, that consolidation happened uh, several, maybe three years ago or so, maybe more than that now, um, they, at times we'll make updates to the solicitation and sometimes it's based on regulations that are passed um, and so these updates uh, are called refresh numbers so the solicitation is an open and rolling rfp request for proposal and as gsa makes updates uh, they'll just there there again is no due date for the solicitation um, so if there's a new requirement they basically um, will end that refresh number and start a new one. So the point I'm trying to make is, let's say you start to put together a proposal today in March and time gets away from you and towards the end of the year, October, November, December, you decide to pick it back up again. You wanna make sure that GSA has not updated the solicitation requirements because let's say they suddenly are now on, Let's say they've gone through refresh 20, 21, 22, and added new hoops to jump through, new forms to complete, new requirements for the SIN. Maybe they deleted some of the SIN numbers. Maybe they've added some SIN numbers. Um, so uh, again, just be cognizant of the refresh number that you are uh, pursuing. And when you first start the process and then uh, towards uh, the submission whenever you're going to submit and make sure that you're still that they are still on that same refresh number again I direct you to sam.gov for the requirements because today is really just high level 
Um, there's some different flavors of GSA. Uh, some may have heard of the GSA Springboard. That's for IT companies with less than two years of corporate experience. Uh, there's also the Fastlane program. That's for existing holders that are adding IT supply chain and defense health uh, initiatives. Uh, and then there are some different um, additional flavors, we'll call them uh, GSA Oasis, STARS, VETS, et cetera. Some of them are based on set-asides or uh, other program goals that GSA has. What we are actually talking about today is what I've highlighted at the top of the screen, which is the standard multiple award solicitation. So just the vanilla uh, GSA schedule. And like any solicitation, uh, or any RFP, you're going to have the three main sections, administrative, technical, and pricing, and we'll go through those uh, one by one, first starting with the administrative. So in your administrative section, you'll have a cover letter, uh, which is pretty self-explanatory. GSA is also going to require your financial statements from the last two full fiscal years. So this is 24 full months balance sheet and income statement. These do not need to be audited. You can simply print them from your QuickBooks or whatever uh, accounting platform you use, ask your accountant to send you a copy, whatever how, whatever the method to your madness is for that. Um, upon submitting your entire proposal to GSA, depending upon what uh, your financial ratios look like, um, you may be um, contacted by GSA even before they get to the review process of your proposal, uh, and they may, you may be asked for uh, a bank reference and to submit the standard form 527. Uh, if you go to Google, you can certainly um, type in the SF 527, again, standard form 527, um, and this, again, may be sent to you based on some of the financial ratios uh, in your balance sheet and income statement. Uh, in addition to the last two full years balance sheet and income statement, you also want to submit your year-to-date balance sheet and income statement. Um, and also as an FYI for any novices out there, um, your income statement may also be titled profit and loss. Uh, there are two GSA, I'll call these quizzes, uh, the readiness assessment and the pathway to success. Readiness assessment may take you 45 minutes to an hour to complete and the pathway to success anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. For anyone that's considering getting onto the schedule, I would highly encourage you to complete both of those. Um, just because they ask a lot of good questions about how many, for example, how many vendors are in your special item number? How many vendors in your special item number have zero sales? Who are the top, what's the average of, I think, the top three vendors uh, sales-wise uh, within your special item number? You should have conducted all of this research before you decided to get onto the schedule. Um, you know, are the sales numbers growing or declining for the last three fiscal years. Again, all of this should be data and research that you've conducted that has led you to decide to pursue the schedule in addition to the human factor of the relationships. Um, so that administrative section is pretty um, self-explanatory and, uh, and fairly easy to complete. Um, you'll also have to, in the GSA eOffer platform, um, uh, Confirm your, I'll call it reps and certs. This is just confirming that everything in your SAM record is in fact current. Um, and it's uh, the couple check boxes in there that are uh, again, repetitive of your SAM offer. That's the administrative section. Now we're gonna move on to the technical. Um, there's I'll say four main components here. The first two I've grouped together, the corporate narrative and the quality control. These are both GSA forms that have specific GSA questions that they want you to answer. There's a two page limit for each, um, the corporate narrative and two pages for the quality control. Um, so you don't need to be overly verbose here, but simply answer their questions and give them the information that they want. Corporate narrative will ask how many full-time employees you have, um, how long you've been in business, what has led you to be uh, proficient in the services that you're offering or the product that you're selling. The quality control will ask who's in charge of quality, what are your processes that you have in place, how do you handle 
any errors, how do you handle multiple projects at the same time. Um, again, answer the questions uh, completely, but this doesn't need to be um, uh, more than two pages, although when you get to the GSA eOffer platform, uh, as you upload this information, it's not in a page format, it's more or less a copy and paste of each of the questions. Um, so, but keep that page limit in mind, it's a certain number of, it translates to a certain number of characters. Um, the third part here is your past performance. Again, I would direct you to sam.gov, encourage you to read the solicitation, specifically the requirements for your special item number. I'm going to say, generally speaking, most SIN numbers are going to require just one narrative. Along with that narrative, that narrative is asking you questions about the type of work that you've done that is related to the special item number. So when you look at the special item number, you'll look at GSA's description and ensure that your description is similar to theirs in the type of work that you've done. Uh, in order to justify that, you'll have to have a copy of that contract that you worked on. Uh, and in that contract, hopefully there is a statement of work that further explains what you did. Um, you wanna make sure that contract is dated, signed, has the dollar amount, and again, most importantly, the statement of work. Some SIN numbers are going to require more than one narrative, uh, and I believe there's still a, um, a SIN number that requires an oral presentation as well. So uh, again, keep in mind what I'm talking about today is just very general. Each of the SIN numbers are going to have their own uh, nuances, but generally speaking, it's um, one, uh, one narrative, again, with specific questions that GSA is asking. This is really your opportunity to shine and explain that you are the uh, expert in your industry for these types of product services or software, whatever your solution happens to be. Uh, the fourth uh, component here are more or less your references and questionnaires. Um, but let me actually just uh, stop for a moment on that past performance. One of the uh, frequently asked questions we get is, does the contract that we're submitting have to be a government contract? It does not. Uh, so a contract is a contract is a contract. It can be a contract um, with a commercial company. It could be with state and local government. It could be with an association. It can be with a nonprofit. It can be with a university. Um, however, I will say if you do have federal work, direct federal work, I would certainly uh, encourage you to include that. If it's as a subcontractor to somebody for federal work, I would include that and uh, you'll need to, I would encourage you to state who the uh, prime is and then the agency and department that the work was performed in. Additionally, on that past performance, there is a time limit. The contracts cannot have ended. Um, they must be within the last three years. On the CPARs or references, if you do have any federal direct work, uh, if you have at least three um, three contracts that are direct with the government uh, and you've got good CPARs, uh, you can then include those on that next section. Um, otherwise, you'll include references. Uh, again, these can be uh, government, subcontracting, associations, nonprofits, whoever your customers happen to be. I would just pick good, happy clients. Um, additionally, there are three questionnaires that uh, will go to your clients. Uh, it will take them longer to open the PDF uh, questionnaire than it will to complete it. Um, it's pretty short and sweet and self-explanatory. Those questionnaires get sent back to you. You'll compile them and upload them into the GSA eOffer system. Okay, uh, on the technical section, I wanted to include some of the nuances for, um, depending upon what industry you're in, if you're selling professional services, then you'll need to include an extract of your HR plan specifically uh, based on compensation. So how and when your employees are compensated. And uh, the other piece that GSA is looking for is overtime, uh, your policy on overtime. Uh, if you have any uh, Service Contract Act uh, labor categories, you'll need to complete the additional forms on that. I would direct you over to the Department of Labor's website for SCA. 
uh, if you are selling products and you happen to be a dealer reseller um, and not the actual manufacturer, you'll need to have your manufacturers complete the letter of supply. This is a GSA form. I would actually encourage you to have the manufacturer read that and ensure that they're going to sign off on it before you decide to get onto the schedule. This would be a showstopper, a deal breaker. So again, make sure that um, that your manufacturer is going to uh, be okay with signing that documentation and that they are okay with the verbiage in that. Uh, products cannot be made on any, cannot be made in any uh, non-TAA, Trade Agreement Act compliant country. So they can't be made in China, um, Russian, uh, the usual Iran, uh, Syria, et cetera. For companies that are selling software, you'll need to include your EULA uh, during the uh, review process. The GSA legal team will go through and redline that and it will get sent back as part of the negotiations um, to you. So uh, make sure that you do include that. Sometimes uh, it's called your master service agreement, but typically your EULA. Again, please read the solicitation to ensure that there are no additional uh, requirements for your particular SIN that need to be um, submitted, particularly for um, software and IT uh, related to FedRAMP. Um, and again, that's a whole nother uh, ball of wax. Again, this is just very high level GSA requirements. Now we'll move on to pricing, which is really where uh, the bulk of your time will be spent in the proposal preparation, as well as in the price negotiations and even post award is really what this all comes down to is pricing. So uh, as part of the proposal package, you will submit your price list. Um, you're either submitting a commercial price list, meaning that you have set rates or market rates. Your rates fluctuate based on what's happening in the marketplace. Depending upon which uh, uh, type of price list you have, you'll then indicate what your EPA is. This is the economic price adjustment, and this will determine how your GSA prices are increased for the out years. Along with that uh, price list, you'll need to have a uh, basically a lot of documentation uh, invoices to show that you have sold these product services or software in the past. Um, your invoices, uh, if you don't have invoices, you can use proposals or quote sheets. I would highly suggest invoices. If you have 10 items that you're proposing to GSA and you have one invoice that lists, that lists all 10 items, that's fine. That invoice will suffice. If you have, if, you can, if it takes you 10 invoices, one invoice for each item, that's fine as well. Uh, again, these don't need to be government. They can be commercial, they could be nonprofit associations, state, local, education, uh, whatever it is. An invoice is an invoice is an invoice. They want to be within the same dates so of, of your commercial price list or your market rates. So if your commercial price list is effective January of 2023, you probably don't want to go back more than a year, preferably no more than two years uh, to pull invoices. So the more current uh, invoices will certainly behoove you because um, I would assume that they would be, one would assume that those would include higher prices. The next component here of pricing includes your price proposal template or your PPT. Uh, this is a pretty um, hefty Excel spreadsheet. You can find this in the solicitation documents on SAM.gov. There's multiple columns where you'll disclose your commercial prices your most favorite customer prices. This is who's getting your best discounts and your proposed rates to GSA. Um, there's a lot more uh, columns than that, but at a high level, that is uh, the main focus. Uh, additionally, you'll want to include a statement why you believe your pricing is fair and reasonable. And this should be a no brainer because um, if, you're, if you've been paying attention during this, webinar, you would have done your homework in advance to determine that your pricing is in sync with the other schedule holders and you would have done your homework and that statement um, would then be um, pretty easy to, uh, to write. The most important document here is the CSP or Commercial Sales Practice Form. This is a GSA form. 
disclosing uh, your pricing discounts and the various policies when and where and who you give your uh, standard discounts to, as well as non-standard, um, if in fact you do give any of those. And so what we'll talk about now are these uh, standard and non-standard discounts and some of uh, more of the details on pricing because again, pricing is the most important piece of this GSA schedule. So when you have your proposal put together, submitted through the GSA e-offer system, it gets sent to GSA and uh, eventually you'll make it to the pricing negotiations. What happens uh, right before that though, GSA is conducting two litmus tests. The first is they're going to look at your internal pricing and compare your standard versus your non-standard discounts. Standard discounts would be, for example, if you have a commercial price list and you're selling widgets, whether that's product services or software, and your company always gives a standard 10% discount to nonprofits and associations, and you give a 15% discount to state and local education. Uh, your sales reps know this, your business development people know it, your accounts receivable know it. Um, everybody within the company knows that this is um, the standard discount that's given. Your non-standard discounts would be your one-off spot discounts. So sales rep is out there, happens to meet, let's say somebody from Northrop Grumman or Lockheed Martin, and there's an opportunity for your company to be a subcontractor to Lockheed for work at Department of Defense. And you guys really wanna get into Department of Defense and you have been trying for years. And so Lockheed presents this opportunity um, and so what you do is discount your rates heavily just because you really want the work. So that would be called a one-time spot discount, something that does not represent how you normally conduct your business. And it also does not represent a large portion of your overall company revenue. Let me pause there and say that GSA is going to look at your GSA proposed rate to them, and they will be looking primarily at your standard discounts. So GSA is not entitled to your non-standard discounts. So if you gave a, let's say, 50% discount to Lockheed Martin, that's obviously extreme, I'm using that for this example to make a point, then GSA is not going to be entitled to that equal to or better than 50%, uh, because again, that was just a one-time spot discount, meaning non-standard, it's not part of your practices. However, uh, let's say again, on the standard side, again, you're giving 10% to nonprofits and associations and 15% to state local, um, then GSA will say, yes, we want that 15% um, or better. So uh, keep that in mind, you can use that as part of your strategy as well. Um, and that is uh, really where we uh, help companies uh, a lot. The second uh, piece here is your, uh, a part of the litmus test is GSA will look at your external, um, we'll do conduct an external pricing comparison. So they're looking at the competitors uh, who sell the same or similar product services or software as you, and they'll use the websites that I have listed here to conduct that analysis. These are public websites, which simply means you should also be doing this before you decide to get onto the schedule. So if you are not doing this before, then shame on you because, again, the pricing is the biggest and most important part of the schedule. So if your prices are going to be 20 to 30 percent higher than the GSA averages, this is not going to work because during the price negotiations, GSA will negotiate you down to these rates. And if that's not something you can live with, then you should not be getting onto the schedule. So again, use these websites to conduct your market analysis and know that that is just one of the two tests that GSA will perform. Okay, and that's more or less what things look like on paper or on kind of on the GSA e-offer platform, but even not really some of the, um, the ways of the uh, data is um, asked of you on the GSA e-offer platform. Uh, e platform does not always uh, translate exactly here, but 
those are the main proposal requirements and those are some websites that should help you even in just deciding to uh, get on or not get on to the schedule. So what does this look like in the real world? Uh, again, I mentioned 18 to 20,000 companies hold a GSA schedule and it's kind of this 80-20 rule, um, but the, the numbers are really that 60% of the schedule holders don't have any sales through their schedule. And, and what does that mean? Uh, it means a couple things. Um, you can infer a couple things that somebody sold them something that they don't need, meaning somebody's out there pushing schedules on people that don't know any better and um, haven't done their homework. Um, or companies have the build it and they will come strategy, which is certainly not a strategy. It's uh, more of a Hail Mary. Um, companies uh, are getting onto the schedule without uh, really knowing what it is. Um, or they could have, uh, you know, a couple million dollars in sales with the federal government, but just not through the schedule. Um, so it, sometimes it's not always so uh, so bleak and negative. But um, and this will just kind of reiterate that. So either, you know, they got the schedule without any relationships in place. There's nothing in their um, pipeline or CRM system where they've talked to um, prospects within the federal government who have said that GSA is their preferred mechanism of purchase. Um, they've, you know, again, the build-in and they will come and, and nobody's coming. Um, and again, this could be somebody is um, out there kind of smiling and dialing and pushing GSA schedules on, on companies um, who, uh, who again, are unsuspecting and don't um, know any better. Uh, or companies have gotten onto the schedule and their pricing is, you know, so squeaky low that um, uh, they're not even able to bid on any work because it'll put them out of business because they, they won't be profitable. And they can't find any employees to, out there to or contractors to work at uh, these very low rates if they're selling uh, professional services. Uh, or they haven't kept in mind, again, that these um, Pricing complexities are really the uh, the main crux here of GSA schedules, um, and they're then kind of stuck by being on the schedule and um, being caught up in what we call the price reduction clause (PRC), where this means that your G you've got a GSA schedule and you've got your rates, uh, your GSA rates, but outside of the schedule, you're actually not allowed to give rates lower than your GSA rate. So, if let's say Department of Commerce comes to you, but they're not buying through the schedule, you cannot give them, just because they're a federal agency, a department, you cannot give them rates lower than your GSA rate. It could be Department of Commerce, it could be ABC Company, it could be Lockheed Martin, it could be University of Delaware. Again, outside of your schedule, you cannot give GSA rates lower than your GSA rate. Uh, and then also you are encouraged to give rates lower than your GSA rate through your schedule. So uh, I think sometimes people are just not aware of what they've signed up for. Um, so read the contract before you uh, sign it. And in this case, uh, there's so much public data that is available in the public sector that allows you to make sage uh, decisions about everything. So let's go ahead uh, and conclude here with some considerations and some things that uh, vendors, that you, the vendor, can do um, in order to help decide if this is a an asset or a liability for your company or potentially would be. Uh, so again, the 80-20 rule, you've got um, the bulk of the vendors on the schedule with basically a big goose egg next to their name uh, and the top um, 20 uh, companies really doing the bulk of the work. Without a relationship, this is uh, really nothing. Um, it's just more, um, more intense competition is, is really what it comes down to. Um, so it's kind of like you're on the varsity team um, and you really have to, to fight for a spot or for the sale. Uh, you should have processes in place again once you're a seasoned company and even if uh, you don't have any federal work, most seasoned companies will have um, best practices in place, pricing uh, methodology and um, labor uh, methodology in place on how and when they are discounting um, services, products, or software. Uh, and again, here, reverse engineering, basically using 
the public data, the public data websites or the data aggregators that you pay um, either a couple dollars a month up to a couple thousand dollars a month to, um, to have data in a easier to use format. So use that data to conduct homework and ensure that this is really how your specific customer uh, or prospect prefers to purchase or, um, or have a strong enough relationship that if you're on GSA, you know that you can box out the competition that's on there because you have some unique um, technical capability that can get written into the solicitation. Um, but really do that. The more time you spend on that upfront research, the better off you'll be because it will narrow your focus, it'll narrow your search, it'll narrow the opportunities, and it'll also narrow your capability, which um, again will allow you to shine and, um, and box out as much as possible. And just because you meet, and even if you exceed the requirements to get onto the schedule, it doesn't mean that it's in your best interest. It doesn't mean that there's going to be a return on the investment for you. And I wanted to have an image here uh, of uh, the roller coaster. It must be this tall to ride uh, and have a picture of uh, two young children, one that meets the height requirement exactly and another one that's you know a couple feet taller. Um, and again, just because you're meeting the requirements, you still need to make sure that this is going to be competitive. Do you have the sales rep and the business development and capture team that understand GSA, that understand federal contracting and understand your solution and have the relationships to drive people uh, to your particular um, contract vehicle if, in fact, it is uh, the GSA schedule? And then just here's some um, questions that you should be able to answer uh, before you decide to get onto the schedule. And all these are everything that I've said throughout today's presentation, but just try to put it onto one slide to make it a little bit easier. Um, or And this could really be key considerations before getting onto any uh, contract vehicle or um, just key considerations for federal contracting. Um, and again, this is all publicly available data, so you don't need to subscribe to a data aggregator. Nothing against them. I would actually encourage using them because they make uh, sifting through these various websites a lot easier. Uh, the various government websites are sometimes cumbersome. Um, so know how big the federal market is for your specific solution. And then I would also encourage going back even more than four fiscal years. I'd go back even before COVID. Um, is really what I'm trying to say here because COVID contracting, we obviously saw some some big winners, big pharma, and then some companies that did not do as well that were focused more on um, in-person, whether it was um, in-person events, conferences, um, uh, people that had on-site services at various federal agencies uh, did not do as well. So you wanna look at contracting trends and use that data to help uh, with your predictive analysis to, to find out what is coming up. Uh, but again, that COVID contracting era kind of threw some of these numbers off. So make sure you're getting the full picture and not basing uh, your contracting trends off of um, a little hiccup, uh, or a big hiccup, I guess I should say, um, in, the, uh, in the procurement space. Um, and then also just look at the breakdown outside of GSA, you know, what went to the various set asides, you know, does that then uh, open up opportunities for teaming um, to potentially take some competition out of the way? If you if you team with a company that's potentially, you know, in the running, um, it means that, you know, uh, you'll potentially get at least a share of the, the pie if, uh, if your team, your joint venture, whatever, however you guys arrange the relationship. Um, that there could be some opportunities to win some business together. Uh, what other contract vehicles are out there? You know, have you really read the terms and conditions? Again, you don't need to be a government contracts attorney, but you should have an understanding of what you're signing up for. Uh, and most importantly, the very last bullet there is uh, how your pricing um, compares to the competition. Again, this can, you know, be conducted um, pretty quickly and uh, depending upon how many uh, line items it is you're proposing, but that should really help um, be one of the main uh, focuses of your research, in addition to just having uh, warm relationships. 
Okay, the slides are on our SlideShare on slideshare.net. You can log in there with your LinkedIn credentials. It doesn't cost anything. The recording is on our YouTube channel. Thanks for everyone who joined with us live. Uh, and thanks again to our friends at the Western Michigan Apex Accelerator for inviting us and having us here today. If you're watching the recording on YouTube, give us a like, leave a question, leave a comment. So we'll be glad to answer any of your questions um, right there in the uh, YouTube um, chat. And uh, feel free to check out any of our other 600, almost 700 plus uh, YouTube videos on government contracting, 30, some of which are covering GSA schedules. So again, I'm Jennifer Schaus coming to you live from Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us today. And again, thanks to the Western Michigan Apex Accelerator.